Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. And we're also going to analyze from the Word of God what God intended for us from the beginning. First, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Number one, that God original plan was never to have a religion. This is important for us to remember and to understand because religion has become more important than God. As a matter of fact, mankind has been worshipping religion more than they even worship God. We adhere so much to our rituals and our idiosyncrasies that we consider to be uh, rituals of holiness and righteousness. You would remember that Jesus himself, when he came to earth, rebuked the Pharisees for making religion more important than God. One of his statements made to them was this. He says, you have made your traditions more important than the laws of God. We have not been much different today. We have made religion so important that we've not even been interested in what God wants. We're more concerned about keeping our little religious rituals. Secondly, I want you to remember that God's plan for you was always rulership. Always rulership. This is basic to God. God never intended for you to be controlled or ruled by anybody, but his original passion was for you to be a ruler. And the third point I want you to remember as we address this subject of kingdom is that your destiny is king dominion. King dominion. In other words, God always intended and his future for us is to be a king over a domain. I believe that one of the saddest things that have come upon the world is the misconception of God's purpose for man. I've heard this often. People have said that man was created to worship. And I don't want to disagree with the, with the concept of that answer, but I'm concerned about the practical application of it. The fourth point I want to make is that the purpose of God is for Christ to restore his kingdom on earth. And that's what God always wanted. In other words, the reason why God sent Christ in the first place is to restore this rulership, this kingdom rulership that he always wanted. The work of Jesus, then, is a work of restoration. And this last point I want to make as we look at some scripture is that because we've been created to rule and to dominate, then the number one purpose and passion in the heart of man is power. Power. Everybody in this room wants power. And if you say you don't, you are telling a lie. Now, why can I be so emphatic about that? Well, let me answer it this way. The passion for every bird is to do what? To fly. Every fish want to do what? Swim. You start them from swimming, they're unhappy. <laughs> you take a fish out of water, it malfunctions. You take a bird out of the air and put him in a cage in your house as a pet, you got yourself an unhappy bird. And don't believe that that bird is tame. You let that bird out of that cage, he does what he's been longing to do all his life. What does a seed want to do? Become a tree. Built for it. 
So whatever God designs something to do, that's what it desires naturally. And when God created you, he was very clear as to why he created you. He created man to have what? Dominion. Not to have singing sessions. Not to have rituals. But it's very clear in Genesis 1.26. God had very clear motives for you. He said, I created you to have what? Dominion. Dominion means to dominate, to control, to manage, to rule, to have power over to have authority over. That means built into every one of you is a natural desire to have power. But look what I note in my notes. To have power over what? Our environment. That's what we want. We want power over our environment. See, that's why you get sick when you owe so many bills. Because you are not in control of your life. The Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender anybody want to be a slave no but you owe people money so you are a slave and that's why you can't wait to pay them off and how do you feel when you pay your last payment on anything oh i tell you you ride around all day smiling i mean being good to everybody right why because you taste a little piece of your natural self you are in control of an area of your life when the bank threatens you that they can call in a loan anytime how do you feel you can't sleep you are uncomfortable because someone else controls you and that is natural for you to feel that way now the reason why you want power is because you are designed to be in power you are a kingdom creature. Say that with me. I'm a kingdom creature. Say it loud. Write it down. I am a kingdom creature. Kingdom means rulership, dominion. King means to rule. And dom means to dominate. Kingdom means I am a kingdom creature. I am a power creature. Now I tell you something that I found interesting in life. Because we are designed to be power creatures, we try to power whatever we can power. We control people we can control. We enjoy being able to tell our children, go and come and sit and clean. And, I mean, it just feels good. Some of us have kids just to feel that feeling. Doesn't it feel good? Take it, sit down. The kid sits down. You go, mm -hmm, right on. Mm -hmm. Boy, that feels good. Have somebody obey me. Because you're tasting power. How about husbands ruling their wives? You may wonder why domestic abuse is such a prevalent problem. It's because the male is, is enjoying the taste of what God originally intended, but he's using the wrong subject. Because in Genesis chapter 1, in the same verse, God said, let them have dominion, but he listed over fish, over birds, over trees and over cattle but never over another human but because we've lost our sense of responsibility because of sin then we enjoy ruling other people how about your feeling when you get promoted on the job why do you feel so happy that you finally got control over some people in a department because you taste dominion power why do people sacrifice what they sacrifice to go into politics? I mean, they go through difficulty to get a position and they run for politics. Why does anybody want to be the president of the United States? Man, tell me. Oh, it's a sweet power. Why do you want to be a representative, a senator? I mean, he, senator's nothing but trouble. You get paid hardly nothing and you spend all these hours debating these bills and and you go home and no one really cares about what you're doing anyhow but just to walk around in that suit of a senate and they call you mr senator there's a feeling power everybody and i know you're not like this you are different people you are special you don't want no power you just you just want to be whatever they tell you to be and do it you you, you. but me i want power i want to control disease over my body 
I want to control my financial life. I want to control my mental ability. I want to be in charge of my own will. I'm normal. Normal. God knew this. Why did Jesus come to earth? I know you think he came to die on the cross and to give his life and to shed his blood and to forgive you of your sins. Well, that's true. But why did he really come? He came to give you power. Remember what he said? He says, I will give you what? Power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and all the power of the enemy and then the Bible says he gave them what power and they went out and they cast out demons healed the sick raised the dead they cleansed the leper and the Bible says they came running back to Jesus and they were so excited and they said guess what it felt so good demons obeyed us and we healed the sick and oh they were so excited Christ says I, and that's, that's normal kids relax don't get excited over the power get excited that your name is registered again in heaven what was his last promise to us wasn't the promise of worship prayer his last promise go to Jerusalem and wait there for what your kingdom creatures Your kingdom preaches. You shall receive what? Power. To do what? He said, when you receive power, you will be a witness unto me. I want you to listen to this statement carefully. He didn't say you won't witness for me. You read that wrong. He says you will witness, be witnesses unto me. In other words, if I claim to be a king, and you are telling people that I am a king and you are in my kingdom the way they will know that you are in my kingdom is not by singing and not by dancing and not by clapping hands but by power some of you are getting it slowly in other words when you become debt free you're showing an area of power. When you become health bound, I mean sickness cannot stay in your body and you live among people, they wonder why are you always well and when you get sick you always get rid of it. What is your secret? How come you get the control over this area of health? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, see? People are attracted to you because you have power. Do you know why we like to know rich people? Of course you don't. You're different again. I like to know them. Do you know why you want to associate with people who get a measure of success? Do you know why? I want to show you something. I'm about to show you something that may shock you. This is this week's 2001 June Newsweek magazine. On the cover is a picture of someone who I think you know. Who's that? Who's that? I think everybody in the world knows Tiger Woods. I was in Nigeria. They, they got pictures on, the, on their shirts with Tiger Woods. I went to South Africa. They, the little kids running around with Tiger Woods on the, on the... I went to England. They got Tiger... Everybody knows this young fella. And he ain't 30 years old yet. The guy is 26. But he's on the cover. Now I want to read what they say about him. You're going to be shocked. It says, the killer instinct, sounds like power, what it takes to dominate. Get close in the camera. I want the folks at home to see that word. See that? Where you, where, where's that word show first in the Bible? Genesis 1. Now this young fella has obeyed God. I'm going to read for you the caption on the inside. I want you to see this. Some of you all think, Pastor Miles, I'm a teacher on this stuff. Look at this. Can anybody read it back there? Come on, those at home, catch it. What does it say? Say it loud. I can't hear you. 
Now, this man is considered right now the most successful golfer in history. Jack Nicholas quotes in this article. I'm going to quote Jack Nicholas. Jack Nicholas says, it begins, they all agree, him and a couple of other top golfers, with good old fashioned hard work. There is no magic pill, no such thing as effortless grace. I like that. Effortless grace. Somebody said, I'm living by grace. You got to put effort in too, you see. Listen, they say, <laughs> At this level, I mean the level that he's at, talent is a given. But Tiger works harder than any other golfer out there. And that is why he is destroying the competition. He is dominating the field. This is incredible, eh? The world's greatest golfer seem to get better and better. How does he do it? He dominates his field. And the caption is what? God says, let them have... Let me tell you what. The reason why you want to get to know Tiger, I know why you want to meet him. Because when you get near to somebody who is what you would like to be, who has what you would like to have, and who has done what you'd like to do, you get to feel a taste of it just being in their presence. That's why you want even this autograph. You want to take a photograph with, not with him really, but with dominion. I wasn't coming through. Now, this is incredible. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. The gospel of what? The kingdom. What makes Tiger Woods successful? They tell you. He is not the jack of many trades. He ain't trying to be everything. He found his gift. He connected with his talent. And his father, at age four years old, gave Tiger his first little golf club at four. Four. And because he noticed the boy liked to watch it on TV. And he was always holding sticks. And so he bought him his first little club at four. And every day, four years old, he took him out. And the little boy was sitting. sitting. He discovered his dominion gift at four and never left it. Went to high school, went to junior high school, you know, but never left his gift until he dominated his gift. He was fruitful, then he multiplied, and then he replenished himself, duplicated himself wherever he went, and now he is subduing the whole area of golf, and therefore he is dominating his field. Power. Tiger Woods, 26 years old, is now being invited by everybody to speak. He ain't got nothing to say. But everybody want to hear what he got to say. Why? We like to hear from power. My question, does anybody seek you out? Do they pursue you yet? Why do we look for doctors when we get sick? They got power. They've dominated an area. Why do we seek for dentists when we get problems with our teeth? They got power. They've dominated one area real well. Why do we seek a mechanic when the cars don't work? They really got power. And we seek out power. When we get problems, we seek out power. Do people seek you out for something specific yet? Let them have dominion. I thought it was intriguing then to share with you some scripture about the kingdom power. Daniel chapter 7. It says, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and they will possess it forever, forever and ever. That's in Daniel 
chapter 7. That's the Old Testament. Daniel saw a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And he saw the future of the world. And he said the whole thing is about some saints receiving what? A kingdom. And they will possess it forever. Let's read. I thought interesting what Isaiah saw. Isaiah said, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then he says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. He says when Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, his focus will be two things. Everybody say government. Everybody say kingdom. Write those two words down, please. Two things that he will be pursuing. Government and kingdom. Not religion and churchianity. Government and kingdom. His entire work will be focusing on this thing called government and kingdom Matthew let's see what Jesus says about it John the Baptist message was a simple message let's read what John the Baptist says now we entered the New Testament in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and he was saying quote repent for the kingdom of heaven is near end quote that's John the Baptist's message what did John preach the kingdom what did he preach about it it's near why his cousin was already around his cousin's name was Jesus remember Elizabeth and Mary were family and so John knew that the kingdom is here somewhere around and it's right in the crowd somewhere around this 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 river now the kingdom is near everybody get ready for what kingdom get ready for what kingdom now what was John's assignment to prepare the way of the Lord but look what John is announcing he's not really announcing a person he's announcing a kingdom and he says the reason for the Messiah is because he comes to bring with him a kingdom what is this in, uh, why is this so important to us let's see what Jesus says afterwards Jesus comes along he says come ye who are blessed of my father take your inheritance what is your inheritance the kingdom which was prepared for you how long ago since the creation of the world powerful stuff hallelujah I told God this morning I just want you to help the people understand the simplicity of your will which is the kingdom we make this so complicated as a matter of fact we are afraid to be kingdom people because it's not religious somehow we have a a guilt complex from our fall and so we try to make up for it not by grace but by works we try to do things so God can like us and a part of that is why we like religion so much we get involved in all kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, we live for worship services, don't we? Well, maybe not you, the person next to you I'm talking to. I mean, you say, boy, I'm going to, the, to worship God. Well, what about Monday or Tuesday? What about all day at work? What about in school, in the classroom? What about in college? I mean, don't you worship God all the time? No, we got this thing built around a few hours in a certain place with a certain steeple, with a certain type of music, see? And we, we almost worship religion and forget about God during the week. Because we are not kingdom people yet. Let me tell you what kingdom is about. It's about citizenship. Are you always a Bahamian or an American? Sure you are. You don't, you, you don't be them once a while, twice a week. You are a citizen all the time. And your citizenship is always with you. And that's why you can move about in your country or in the world safe and protected by your government authority because you are a citizen. The same thing is true about kingdom. Kingdom is citizenship. It's not religion. So Christ says, 
this kingdom was yours before the world began. In other words, God created a kingdom first, prepared it for you. Look at that verse again. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared just for you. What is kingdom? Kingdom is governing rulership. It's power, dominion. It's taking control over an area and that's what he prepared for you. God didn't prepare heaven for you. He prepared a kingdom for you that would extend heaven to another area. Why am I teaching? This is practical for Monday. When you go out of your house, no, when you go into your house, no, when you go into your car, no, when you go into your bedroom, that's kingdom territory. And you must therefore think that way. You know, <laughs> Matthew 4, 17, my favorite verse of the kingdom, is Jesus' first statement. From that time on, he began to preach what? Out loud, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In other words, John the Baptist started it, and he picked up, and he says, it's here. And that word near means has arrived. I came to bring the kingdom. Matthew 10, 7 says, as you go, talking to the disciples now, preach this message. Quote, the kingdom of heaven is near, or has arrived. Now, why I give you these scriptures? Because these are progressive. First, we read Daniel. Daniel says, the saints shall inherit the kingdom. Then we read Isaiah. Isaiah says, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and there'll be no end to his kingdom. Then we jump over to the New Testament. John the Baptist says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's coming. And then Jesus comes and says, hello, the kingdom has always been yours. And finally he says, it's here. That's what it's about. But the question is, what is a kingdom? And that's what we really want to talk about. Because everything is about a kingdom, eh? Matthew 13, verse 18 and 19 says these words. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Boy, when I read this and meditate on this this week, this thing jumped out at me because I never really noticed the emphasis Pastor Richard he put on this kingdom. In this, you know, the, the problem with the sower, everybody talk about the sower, you know. You talk about this guy sowing seeds. That's talking about preaching and, and, you know, different people responding to the word different ways. But look at what Jesus said that the parable means. He says, and watch how he relates it to the devil. Oh, this is deep. Please don't miss this. This is heavy. He says, look, the parable is this. When anyone hears what? The message of what? The kingdom. And does not understand it, what happens? Then the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. What is the devil mostly afraid of? Look, read that. He's hoping that you keep it religion, you keep doing your rituals, but the devil hope you never understand what? The kingdom. Now some of you, you know, I mean, I was brought up, I was brought up a Baptist, I was brought up a, 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 a Pentecostal, I was a part of the Brethren Church, I went to the Anglican, I was a part of all the Assemblies of God, and they preached everything. They preached except the kingdom. I knew about the cross. They taught about the blood of Jesus. And they talk about the power of God. They talk about, you know, the, 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 they got to live right and live holy and, and they got into all this stuff. But he says, the devil don't mind if you learn about all that stuff. Are you all getting the point? Christ says the, the, the point of the parable is for you to understand the kingdom. And Satan's got one goal. To do what? Snatch any opportunity for you to understand the kingdom. So right now, I'm telling you right now, I believe that the devil is in the Bahamas. Why do I believe that? I believe he's right here in the diplomat center. I know you're here. Because according to the word of God, you can preach anything else. But when you preach the kingdom, this guy gets angry. And I know there are big demons here this morning. Big principalities. I invite you to hear me preach. Because I got a power and authority over you scorpions and you serpents. Now you all can sit there and you sit there and act crazy. According to Jesus, they can come because I got what? Dominion over them. 
the reason why the devil would even talk to you about not coming to hear this teaching. No, oh, Pastor Miles, I've been talking with this king. See, that's the problem. That's the devil talking to you or you talking for the devil. Because the one thing he never wants you to understand is kingdom. Now remember, kingdom is not religion. So he's not concerned about you getting all the teaching on Calvary and all that stuff. Because Calvary is not the kingdom. Calvary is the means to the kingdom. Christ told Nicodemus, he says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Born again is not the kingdom. It's the way into it. So preaching born again is not enough. You got to listen to the voice of Jesus carefully. He says Satan is after making sure you don't understand it. And that's why I have been given an assignment by God in my generation. And that is to restore the kingdom of God back to the church. And then to the community and to the world. Our, my greatest challenge in life is preaching to, to, to Christians. Because I've got to help you unlearn some things and then learn some things. And boy, that's tough. Because sometimes people say, well, I want a good old-fashioned message of the blood. But you already saved. You don't need that. I need a good old-fashioned message on sin. A good old-fashioned message on holiness. No, Christ talked to, Christ talked to the, to the, to the self-righteous people about sin. He never talked to the sinners about sin. He didn't talk to his disciples about sin. He talked to the self-righteous, those Pharisees and scribes who thought they didn't need God. Why? They had religion. They're the sinners, he says. I didn't come to, to save those who are well. He said, you think you're well? You, I can't help you. But his passion was for everyone to come into the kingdom because the kingdom is the key to your struggle in life. It gives you back power. It gives you back the thing that you're missing. It gives you back control over your own environment, your own destiny. The kingdom gives you back control of your life. And that's what you want. And even though you don't know how to, do, how to articulate that, that's what you want. That's what you're looking for. You know, do you know why you want to be a millionaire at 40? i tell you why. So you don't have no bills. You don't want to be controlled by anybody. And that, I mean, deep inside, that's really the thought behind that thought. You all look so holy. Why are you looking at me like that? I don't want to be no millionaire. I just want to pay my bills and just make it myself. Stop lying. You want plenty of money so you can fly where you want to fly, do what you want to do, wear what you want to wear, go where you want to go, eat what you want to eat, and be with who you want to be with, and drive what you want to drive, and go anywhere and stay as long as you want without having the people worrying about how you going to pay the room rent. Am I speaking the truth? Some of you are so spiritual now. The kingdom of God is practical. Every time you read, and oh, stay with me for the next few months, because you can understand. Every time Christ preached the kingdom, the Bible says, then he healed those who were sick. And then what? And then when they were hungry, he fed them. In other words, he had complete control. Every time it says he preached the kingdom of God unto them, and then he healed them who were sick. In other words, the kingdom of God was the point. And then he said, let me show you how it works. It gives you control over your environment. It controls your hunger. It controls your disease. It controls your need for water. It controls everything. That's why in the... Oh, Tobu Shata Masata. When them kids came out of Israel, out of Egypt, that was kingdom stuff. Man, you know what it is for you? You ain't got to worry about water. It come out of the rock. Food come out of the sky. Health come from a serpent on a pole. Man, this is kingdom business. I like this kind of life. Do you know why they didn't make it? Watch this. Because they were so used to being in slavery. They couldn't handle freedom of dominion. Could you imagine having your, all your bills paid, water at your command and food coming out of the sky and you still want to go back and work for Pharaoh? In other words, I tell you all at the beginning of the year that Jubilee is a tough place to live. It feels funny to not have bills to pay if you've been paying bills for 40 years. All of a sudden you're free. Some of y'all say, boy, if I win the lottery, you win the lottery. You win the lottery, you'll still be going to work. Because it's, it's not about not working. It's about understanding dominion. 
Christ says Satan is after one thing in your life and that is to make sure you don't understand the kingdom oh hallelujah he don't mind you going to church and singing in the choir and you know being an usher and being a deacon even being a preacher just don't understand the kingdom and you live your whole life under pressure and the burdens and the worry and as a matter of fact you die young from all these ulcers and, and tension and heartache and high blood pressure why because you ain't living kingdom life you know what kingdom life does it, it cancels worry why do you worry what you will eat what you will drink what you will wear isn't that why you're working yes my father know you have need of these things but don't worry about them why seek ye first why well, there he goes again and it's righteousness and all these things are kingdom stuff so if we working hard for these things it must mean that we ain't quite get kingdom yet huh look at Luke 12 31 but seek ye first the kingdom and these things will be given to you as well seek ye first the kingdom and these things you know I was thinking about the Pat listen man you gotta read the Bible 20 times to understand one verse you know I thought I know this book this book is brand new book to me and it's been 31 times I read the book you know what God says he says you don't work for food and clothes you don't work for house he says just get in the kingdom and these things will what they will come to you so if we are under pressure trying to make a living it's because we ain't kingdom yet apparently kingdom is supposed to be the answer to everything 40 hours a week we give someone else our time and we give it in exchange for what? For money. So that we could do what? Buy food to eat, clothes to wear, uh, keep a roof over our heads, so that we can pay uh, some school fees. And we do that until we're 60, they give us a watch, and then we die. What a life. That's about it, huh? And then the rest of our time we spend in traffic going to the place. It's not God's will. Something's wrong with this. Look at the statement in verse 33. Luke, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. The father is pleased to give you what? The kingdom. Not to give you religion. Let me, let me go through something very quickly here that I want to share with you. Uh, what is kingdom then? First of all, a kingdom is defined in the Bible from a Greek word basilia and the word basilia means sovereignty royal power and dominion I like that it is the father's good pleasure to give you what sovereignty royal power and dominion let me read it again he says it is the father's good pleasure to give you what the kingdom kingdom is what basilia so Christ used this word he says it's the father's good pleasure but to give you what sovereignty royal power and dominion Anybody wants that? If you want to raise your hand, let me see. Any, anybody want that? How many of you want sovereignty over all your bills? And how many of you want royal power over all your sickness and disease? Come on, say amen, man. How many of you would like to have dominion over every problem in your life? Lift your hand up and say, Lord, I receive that, that promise. You promise? It's your pleasure to give me the kingdom. I receive sovereignty, dominion power royal power over all of life right now in Jesus name clap your hands believe that promise that's what he came to do all right you know I believe if, it, if you can't use it on Monday then don't preach it on Sunday so here we go I want to give you the practical side of the kingdom this is going to be important to write down God's original plan then of course was to influence the world from heaven through his children that's what the whole ministry of kingdom is all about God wanted to rule the earth from heaven through his family of sons write that statement down that's the entire purpose of the Bible 
That's the message of God right there. God's message in contemporary terms is simply, he desired to rule the earth from heaven through his family of sons. That's the, the entire purpose of God for man. He wanted to rule the earth from heaven through his family of sons. And that's it. And if you want to read anything with the Bible, understand it, you got to build, every, build everything on that statement. By the way, uh, you know, I'm, co I'm considering writing a book. It's been on my mind the last three or four months. I want to write a book to teach every human, especially believers, on how to study the Bible effectively. I'm going to write a book on that. Because I want you to... to to learn this important constitution you have in your hand. Now, one of the ways you study the Bible effectively, the way to read the Bible effectively, is what I'm giving you right now, okay? This is, people think that I'm deep. No, what I have learned is how to understand the basics. Once you understand the basics, you can interpret the complicated. I'm gonna try it again. Once you understand the basics, you can interpret the complicated. When you talk to a mechanic or to a pilot or whatever, you got some pilots here, right? But the pilot's a pilot. Oh, that's the, you, you, now you think flying a plane is very complicated. It's not to him. When they go to school, you take flying lessons, they put you in the classroom first, and they teach you theory. Now, theory is what? The basics. They teach you about aerodynamics. They teach you about how you use aerodynamics to get this equipment off the ground. Simple stuff. I mean, flying a plane is very simple. Don't worry about all those buttons. It's, listen, don't let them impress you. Ask them. It's very simple. All you got to do is get the engine to move at a certain uh, velocity that will be able to turn the aerodynamics principle so that there's lift. Once there's lift, you're off the ground. That's the principle. So the Wright brothers figured out a simple principle. Do you know that Abraham could have flown a plane? Abraham could have, Moses could have flown a plane. There's nothing new on earth now that wasn't there when Moses was here. Everything they used to fly a plane was there in Abraham's day. The only problem is Abraham didn't understand what? The principle. He didn't put the things together. There was iron and steel and aluminum and there was wind and there was air. And there was gravity. Everybody was, was present, but they couldn't put it together. Now, what I'm giving you right now is one of the most important secrets of studying the Bible. That last statement, write it down. Once you understand the original purpose of a thing, you can interpret anything people say about it. For example, if you get the basics wrong, then you interpret everything else wrong. Can I give you an example? Suppose I read it this way. The purpose of God is to leave earth and take every man to heaven to live forever. Now that is a, a message people are preaching. But if you believe that, then everything you read in the Bible is interpreted through that basics. So when you read Revelation 21, it says that, you know, they reign on earth forever, you ignore that. Because as far as you're concerned, we're supposed to live in heaven forever. See? So you got problems with even the Bible. So if you get the basics wrong, you get the complicated wrong. People say to me, but Pastor Miles, you don't preach on prophecy. I don't need to preach on prophecy. I know the end already. You read prophecy to get deep. And people use these things to impress you because you don't know any better. Oh man, he's deep man. The beast and the eye and the horns. Ooh, he. All I know is that, you know, uh, God's establishing a kingdom. And there's a kingdom of darkness that's going to try to destroy it. But the kingdom of light is going to overcome the kingdom of darkness. And we're going to win. That's it. Now, the guy who can try, it's called the beast. And he can possess one fella. And they can try to whip us up. But we're going to whip them down. And we're going to win. That's simple to me. I ain't got to teach hours on no prophecy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not playing no prophecy. But if you understand the basics. The basics. So I'm telling you. It is about a kingdom. What is a kingdom? Well, here we go. Number one, all kingdoms are characterized by the following. Number one, a king. 
Every kingdom has to have a king. That means a sovereign, a person who rules in it. There's no kingdom without a king. Number two, every kingdom has to have a territory. A territory has to be, is to do with a domain. You've got to have a domain to have a kingdom. There's got to be an area that you dominate, a place. A, 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 an actual place. Now heaven is God's domain. That's why the Bible says uh, when you pray, pray like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth like what? It is in heaven. Now, heaven is a kingdom where God rules, but God don't want you to rule up there. He wants you to rule on earth. So he says, look, the same way I'm ruling my domain, I want you to rule your domain. That's all the prayer means. Don't get deep on the prayer. He says, pray. What do you pray? He said, here's a prayer you pray. And when you pray, pray this every day, he says. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We are on earth like it is in heaven. He said, pray that. Why? Because that's what God wants. To pray means what? To pray means to desire something. To, to pray means to ask God to do something he always wanted to do. Prayer is not trying to convince God to do something you want. Prayer is reminding God of what he said he wanted to do. What does God want to do? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what God wanted. And so the territory is important. Heaven is God's domain. What is our domain? Yes, man. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he gave to man. So if we don't dominate the earth, we are not fulfilling God's will. And the way you dominate the earth is by what? Kingdom life. If you don't live in the kingdom, then the world is dominating you. I, oh, I see the scriptures coming in my spirit. I mean the Holy Ghost is doing stuff in my mind. Psalm, no. Matthew 9 says, And Christ saw them, the multitudes, and they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers. And then he called them unto him, and he sent them out two by two. I'm quoting all the scriptures. And he said unto them with these instructions, Do not go <laughs> to the Gentiles, but go first to the lost sheep of Israel. And say unto them, the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Okay, what was he seeing? Harassment. What did he saw them? Harassed. By what? Life. I mean, they go into work every day working hard and they ain't happy. Everybody going to work working hard and they ain't happy. Everybody frustrated working hard and they ain't happy. Everybody going back and forth just acting like they're happy. Going to party but getting drunk. Having a hangover in the morning. Going back to work. Coughing up, puking up. Everybody else. He said, man, this is crazy. He said, look, tell them there's a kingdom. The answer to our harassment, he says, is getting into this kingdom. Don't let the earth control you. Do you know what drug, drug uh, addicts need? Kingdom life. How can a leaf control your life? Talk to me, man. A leaf is running your life from, from Colombia or from some other country. I mean, tobacco, uh, controlled by a leaf. You're supposed to dominate the earth, not the earth dominate you. Huh? Kingdom life. So the reason why I don't drink and smoke and, and steal and all that stuff is because I'm a kingdom man. I, I, I've taken control over leaves. They don't control me. So I eat the ones that don't control me. I like lettuce. Anybody talking to me? Yeah. Now there are two ways to eat grapes. You can eat grapes as liquor or eat grapes as grapes. I decide to eat them in a way they can't control me. Clap. Good place to clap. I, trick, I take my liquor through grapes. Why? Because I am a dominator. I dominate this fruit. The Bible says, he that waited till the wine moveth in the cup is not wise. Proverbs 8, chapter 24. He that wait till the wine, what? Move it. That means it fermenting, you see? It move. He said, don't wait till it move it. Why? It, it will, he said, for he who, he who partakes is not wise. A wise man, don't wait till the great drink move by itself. <laughs> Why? You're supposed to be a dominator. The Bible says, Woe to the lamb when a slave becomes king, and when its nobles drink wine in the morning. In other words, drunken MPs. 
The Bible is deep. The Bible says if your MPs go to work drunk, they can make drunken decisions and drunken legislation and drunken bills coming in your drunken country. So the Bible says the king should not drink wine. You don't want no half-cut prime minister making decisions for you. No president always half-cut coming in that making decisions for your children. Why well, the Bible is deep, isn't it? It's right here. Why? It's about what? Kingdom in control. When you lose control, you ain't in the kingdom no more. And this includes your sexual life, it includes your emotional life. When you let people play with your emotions and you can't hold yourself, man, you ain't in kingdom. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you what? The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, self-control. It's dominion over everything. It's kingdom. Territory. Number three, every kingdom must have a citizenship. Citizenry. That means subjects. Fourthly, every kingdom must have a constitution. That's the covenant. Every kingdom must have a covenant. And fifthly, every kingdom must have laws. These are principles by which people live by in a kingdom. And number six, every kingdom must have something. Must have a government. There's no kingdom without a government. What's, what's, what's a government? A ruling authority. Every kingdom must have it, all right? And and every kingdom must have privileges. These are rights. This list is a very important list to write down because it helps to describe your country. And the same thing we're going to learn in the Bible is exactly what God teaches about his kingdom. And next, every kingdom, please press that for me, please, sir. Every kingdom must have codes of ethics. Uh, we call these conduct or lifestyle. And boy, the Bible talks a lot about this stuff, eh? Let me go to the list again, because this is where we're going to pick up next time. But a king, every kingdom got to have a king. We know who our king is in the kingdom of God. Who's our king? Jesus says, I am a king. But my kingdom is not of what? This world. I'm not a part of these politics in the world. He says, man, I have a kingdom above them. My kingdom is out of this world. It's out of the world. And that's what he invites you and I to be a part of. But guess what? He says, the kingdom, that kingdom is yours from the beginning. We were not supposed to rule the earth from a kingdom from earth. We're supposed to rule the earth from a kingdom that's not of the earth. So when man makes decisions based on his own ingenuity, then we get laws and policies that man invent, which is what's corrupting us today. That's why Moses, when God wanted to create a nation, what did God do? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What did God do to create a nation? First, he went where there was zero. He started with zero, Holly. He went and picked up slaves. God didn't start with no group of people who already had an organization, who already had a constitution. He started with zero, people who were slaves. He said, now let me create a nation and show people how to create nations. He created a nation with zero. He took slaves that were slaves for 400 years. He said, Moses, bring them out here for me. So Moses brought them out in the desert. God said, okay, tell you what. First, let's establish who's the king. Tell them I will be their God, they'll be my people. That's kingship. Okay. Territory. He says, there's a land of Canaan, milk and honey. That's where we're going, of our territory. Third, citizenship. They will be my people. I will be their God, citizenship. Constitution, covenant. He says, come up to the mountain and let's talk. What's God doing? Creating a constitution that is out of this world. Pharaoh had their own constitution. The Hittites, Moabites, she Jebusites, Amorites, everybody got their own constitution. Babylonians, everybody got He said, look, Mo, my constitution, you can't write. You got to come in my office come to the Mount of God and I'm gonna to dictate to you my constitution my what covenant and God gave Moses a constitution no one else has ever written and when I went to college they taught me about the Mahammurabi code anybody ever heard that word Hammurabi, Mahammurabi code the Hammurabi code is a code that they say was what was uh, written almost during the time of Moses but they say that he stole it from Moses 
Do you know all of our laws we try and steal from Moses? Guess where Moses got his from? God. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. That, that ain't, we didn't invent that, that's not our law, but that came from Mo. Where Mo got that from? God, thou shalt not what? Commit adultery, thou shalt not what? Bear forward, don't lie. Why? You go to the court from now and you lie, they put you contempt of court, put you in jail. But that came from God, not from Moses. You get my point? This week, you are not supposed to live according to the laws of this land. You're supposed to live according to the laws of God, which respects the laws of the land, but not limited to them. Are you with me? The laws of the land may say, well, you can only go so far in life. The law of God say, you know something, all things are possible, so forget that law. <laughs> it's about in this business, you only can do so much you know, success. God said, now you got to ignore that law because that's violating my law, because my law say you can do See, so there's some times when the law of the land ain't enough. So you got to be on. Go be, oh, Jesus, man, I tell you, you understand what I'm talking about? The kingdom, that's why if you live in the kingdom, you don't live limited. He gave them their constitution. Every kingdom has its own covenant. Our covenant is our constitution of our country. In America, you got a constitution. That's a covenant with the people between themselves. But our constitution is a covenant between us and God. This book is our kingdom constitution. We obey this law. And any time a law violates this law, then we move a little higher into our kingdom and create problems for the other kingdoms, of course. Are you with me? Yeah. So when they say to you that people like you can't get promoted, you just smile. Because according to your constitution, it says, Promotion does not come from the east nor from the west, but it comes from God. So if you are my boss and you don't promote me, then I appeal to my government upstairs and they will remove you. In other words, kingdom life is where God wants you to live so you don't be limited to the beggarly elements of the earth. And this last comment I want to make about privileges. We're going to get into this next week. Every kingdom has privileges. We call them rights, eh? In some countries they call them civil rights. Well, the kingdom of God has rights like any other kingdom. And that's why the word is called righteousness. Righteousness means right standing with the government so you can claim your privileges. No good thing will the government withhold from you if you walk uprightly. In other words, you stay in line with the government. You don't disobey the government. What? Laws, principles. You violate the principles. The law says, you know something, you just shut down your privileges. The Bible says God does not hear the prayer of a, a sinner. That's not referring to the guy who ain't saved. <laughs> it's referring to the guy who say he's saved, but he's sinning. He violated the law. You know something? There are some people in the body of Christ who are illegal immigrants. <laughs> What's an illegal Im immigrant? Somebody who is in the territory, but they ain't got no papers. Have mercy, Jesus. There's some folks sitting up in church never been born again, never gave their life to the Lord, never gave themselves over to Jesus, and they come to church every day figuring that if they hang out with the saints, they'll be a saint. Going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Christ told Nicodemus, I know you were here at the temple, you go to service every day, you wear your robes, and you're in charge of scriptures, but except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you're here this morning, and you've been religious, you've been religious, you've been religious, and you've been to churches, and you've done your church thing, you're still not a citizen. You know, we got a lot of people in the Bahamas who are in the Bahamas for a long time, and they are not citizens. And every time they see police, they're scared. Immigration officers give them the palpitation, palpitations. Yeah? And some folks are that way. 
Some folks know that they're afraid to die because you die, you go to hell. You go to church every day when you go to hell. You need to be born again. You got to get into the kingdom. And there's only one way to get into the kingdom, no other way except through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And that's what the death was for, to secure your salvation. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.